and tax administration. Um, most of you have been to some of our meetings before, um, so, so you've probably heard the spiel and, and seen it. But basically, we're here just to look at regulations for short-term rentals. Um, the board asked us to come up with something in light of what the state, um, the General Assembly did. Um, so we'll propose something to them that you know gives them rules that would allow them to create the registry if that's the path they want to take. So we've been trying to kind of define our parameters for what it is we want to, can you all hear me? For what it is we, um, you know, we want to propose for them so they can consider whatever option that, that they want. Um, in, in terms of the, the timing, we don't have a real proposal yet. What we're trying to do, we've been to the Planning Commission's Land Use Committee, we've been to the Board of Supervisors Development Process Committee, um, so we've gotten all their feedback. We kind of know what needs to, you know, what guidelines they want us to put out there and kind of the parameters they want us to establish for them to review in their public hearings. Um, so we're working on that. But this, this will be our um, hopefully last uh, public input meeting until we actually have something real that people can look at that looks something like a proposal. So Lily is, um, uh, Lily Agazu is the staff person in our office who is, uh, responsible for writing this amendment. So she'll, she'll have a brief presentation and then with so few people would just open it up and you know questions, comments, whatever it is you all want to do and get you out of here so you can watch some ads. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Donna, and Thank you for coming tonight. Oh, it's one at a time. Okay. So um, as Donna mentioned, we have done a community survey and we've had three meetings so far. Um, I will briefly go over the survey results, which uh, was a uh, response rate at 7,600, and out of those, we had approximately 3,200 um, written comments that we received, and those comments included all uh, sorts of concerns that we have heard at the community meetings and at one-to-one um, -one meetings we've had with uh, individuals and, and uh, interested stakeholders. The uh, survey came from almost all parts of the county, uh, and uh, this map shows you the response rate uh, with an overlay of the uh, magisterial districts. So as you can see, almost every district had a response. We, we tallied up the written comments that we received and categorized them into three groups. Basically those that said we um, oppose short-term rentals in all circumstances, that was about 28%. There was approximately 23% that said, you know, this is a self-regulating type of business, so the county should stay out of it, and that was about 23%. And then approximately 49% um, say they would support some type of uh, short-term rental provided there were some regulations and provisions put in place that would address the concerns that, would, that was uh, raised in the uh, comments. The concerns basically were um, categorized into nine groups. <clears throat> the highest response rate was addressing neighborhood uh, character, changes to the neighborhood and what impacts it would have. Uh, followed by inspections, enforcement, and complaints, how that would be addressed, what the process would be. Um, security and safety was another top concern that people had, and also parking and traffic, what, um, how parking would be addressed in any type of regulation that we may come up with. Some of the comments that we received at uh, the three meetings we've had so far also reflect reflected these concerns. 
uh, negative impacts on property values, which were characteristics of um, neighborhood uh, character changing, parking and safety. Um, and there were also some comments we received that you know short-term rentals are um, are desired uh, if the homeowner is there versus investors you know operating short-term rentals. Um, there were comments that you know these types of short-term rentals in residential homes do provide for additional or supplemental income for people to afford their housing, and that they also provide um, you know additional income uh, as mentioned earlier for home ownership or to stay in their homes for uh, people that are maybe uh, single parents or retired people to keep their their housing affordable. There were also comments about you know ha making affordable stays for people that are coming into the town for interviews or traveling nurses, and they would uh, support short-term rentals uh, for, because of those reasons. So uh, staff has been looking at um, ordinances and regulations that are put in place in other jurisdictions, and we have looked at all the comments from the survey and the community meetings. And we have drafted up some um, outline for a potential provision um, for us to look at. The first thing we had to do was, because the existing ordinance does not have a definition of a short-term rental, we looked at um, defining it and putting it in our ordinance. But uh, we, we, we have a definition for short-term rental in our tax code already that addresses rentals of equipment or maybe, you know, other um, other uh, tuxedos, tuxedos and disco and balls like that, and long splitters and things like that yes, for yeah. short-term rentals. So in order not to create a conflict with that, we're going to call it short-term lodging, being short-term, the part short-term rentals so will still be consistent with the definition that is included in the state code that enabled us to uh, do this amendment. And as you can see, the uh, short-term rental definition would be any um, rental or occupancy of a, of a unit for less than 30 days in exchange for, uh, for uh, money, basically. And it would not include accessory dwelling units, bed and breakfast, hotel, or motel. Mm -hmm. uh, we also defined the operator as the proprietor of any dwelling, sleeping or lodging accommodation, offering short-term lodging. It could be the owner, the renter, and we see as long as they have the appropriate approval to participate. So we, we divided the standards into three groups. The first one would relate to the operator, um, basically who would be the operator, and would uh, a person or someone to qualify as an operator, would they need to have uh, lived at that unit for a certain number of uh, nights, basically establishing uh, primary residence. We looked at other jurisdictions where, for example, Arlington has a primary residence requirement of 185 nights per year, and San Francisco has 275 nights per year. That means you can rent out your unit for 90 days out of the year without you being present, or uh, you have to be there for 275 nights in the case of San Francisco. Arlington is slightly different. You have to be in the unit for 185 nights to establish primary residence. So the rest of the year, that's like basically half the year and half the year you don't need to be there. Uh, tenancy of residence is resident. That means whether you are an owner or a renter. So we're looking at, we're looking at which one would be um, uh, applicable and most jurisdictions allow both owners and renters to participate. In terms of uh, standards that would apply to the dwelling unit, we're looking at uh, allowing it in uh, the type of dwelling unit that it would be allowed in. And this was one of the questions we asked uh, the survey takers to tell us where it should be allowed, what type of dwelling. And the response rate we got was in almost all type of uh, dwelling units, including single family, multi-family apartments and including mobile homes. Um, we are looking also at maybe limiting the amount of um, multi-family 
units in apartment complexes different from the renter um, uh, participating in um, that maybe 10 to 15 percent of the total number of units. Um, requirements for the dwelling unit to meet life safety uh, requirements including carbon monoxide, uh, detectors, fire extinguishers, providing emer emergency exit, and uh, second means of egress from bedrooms. That might be something that we would include in our um, uh, standards. And consistently, we've looked at uh, it in other jurisdictions that it is required that they meet all of these uh, life safety issues. Um, another thing we looked at is whether there should be consent for reasonable access and inspections. Once a permit or register, a unit is registered, then it's basically uh, consenting that code enforcement and other departments may enter the property for inspections and making sure that the, the unit and operation is consistent and compliant with the regulations we may be coming up. Um, standards that relate to the operation includes the number of nights a uh, unit may be uh, rented out per year, and that will depend also on how many nights a uh, unit may be rented if the operator is present and when the operator is not present. Uh, we looked at our survey re results. When the operator is present, almost half of the survey um, takers specified there should be no limit if the operator is present. About 18% recommended 30 nights per year maximum, and others ranged from zero to 35. Um, we also looked at other jurisdictions. Again, as mentioned earlier, Arlington and San Francisco do not have any limitation if the operator is present. Um, Blacksburg, for example, has a limitation of 90 days per year when the operator is present. When the operator is not present, Blacksburg limits it to 30 nights out of the 90, that is the total allowed to be rented, but Arlington and, um, does not have any limit, while San Francisco has a 90 day limit. So there is a whole range of um, <coughs> provisions out there. Um, we, we, we run this by uh, the Board of Supervisors uh, Development Process Committee, and we got some feedback that also ranges maybe 180 days a year when the operator is present and we will be looking at uh, presenting a whole range when we advertise this, um, uh, these standards. Standards related to operation again include the limitation on the number of bedrooms that may be uh, applicable for uh, a short-term rental. Um, some jurisdictions do not have any limitations at all, some limited to five bedrooms. And also we looked at how many adults per, per bedroom could occupy a short-term rental. Um, again, that ranges from uh, two adults per bedroom or there's a, a different type of standards where there's a maximum of six adults in the unit altogether that will be on the bedrooms. Uh, the direction we will be looking at it would be maybe consistent with the response rate of two adults per bedroom. That was the response we got from the survey. Um, in, in, in our discussion with the uh, committee, um, what we looked at is maybe just put a limit at uh, limiting the occupancy consistent with the maximum allowable per building code, which usually is uh, similar to what you see here and with the six adults, but we will have to look into that. Additional um, provisions include prohibiting uh, commercial activities like weddings, but, um, parties, um, you know, renting out the, the pools for um, gatherings, large gatherings and, and events, including seminars, all types of um, activities that are commercial and may create a lot of uh, noise issues. Uh, we also looked at maybe limiting the number of contracts per night to one. That is consistent with most uh, jurisdictions that we've seen, except for San Francisco that has a maximum of five. Um, 
58% of the survey takers uh, supported putting a limit on the number of contacts per night, while 32% 30, did not support a limit in that it should be, uh, it, should, it should not be limited. What does that mean by the number of contracts? So when you, when you rent out a unit, uh, could be a bedroom or the whole unit, but some people rent out different bedrooms to different individuals. So yeah. it's in one contract, they might have to, depending on the number of bedrooms. So San Francisco allows you to have up to five unrelated people, basically five individual contracts per night, but most jurisdictions limit it to one contract. One, it could be one family, it's not a limit on the number of people, it's on the number of contracts that you sign or the application that you sign. Um, one other thing that came up, and this was an issue that was uh, raised in the survey as well, is how is parking addressed? Um, in our research, most jurisdictions do not require parking for these short commercials. We came across one um, jurisdiction that is looking at maybe requiring parking, and this is Montgomery <coughs> County. They're still going through the process. They haven't adopted anything, but what they're proposing is maybe require one off-street parking per contract uh, to be provided on site, unless if you're not able to provide parking on site, then you have to um, include information on the listing itself that there is no parking and you should not bring a car along with you. Whether it's Airbnb, whether it's uh, um, VRB or any of the platforms that you um, advertise should indicate that there is no off-street parking and should not, you should not bring a, a car with you. So we will look more into it and see what would be. So how do you guarantee off-street parking? And that's yes. our question too. Yeah, parking. How do you get parking's to tough. There's no question. Parking. Yeah. Parking's tough. Um, you know, if you're in a single family dwelling, you might be able to do that, yeah, depending on what your lot's right. like. But if you're not, you you might have a different a different that that's why it's it's hard for us to sort of come up with something to propose right. because the circumstances are so very different. Mm -hmm. And there was a big um, there was a lot of discussion by the board of supervisors on that when we presented this, and you know, there are some who are very concerned about it, others are not as concerned. So uh, we're going to have to figure out a, a way to. Yeah, yeah we'll propose something, but yeah. we're not. Gonna um, we also looked at what type of permit would be um, applicable. It, it, you know, most jurisdictions have permits that are renewable every year. Some have uh, required it, renewing it every two years. So we will be looking at what would work for us as well, depending on you know, how many applications we come in. It may be something that could be renewed online with some affidavits, but we will look at that. Um, additional standards would include establishing a fee. Um, the state code uh, states that we can have a reasonable and we're looking at what is reasonable. Arlington has $63 per year, San Francisco is $250 per two years. Some jurisdictions don't have any fee, so we will be looking at different um, amounts for that. Um, the permit would probably be revocable if you know the uh, short-term rental is not operating per the standards we establish. If there are maybe a number of complaints other jurisdictions, what we've seen is if you have more than three substantiated complaints, then it would be revocable for the next for the for that year and the following year, and you cannot reapply until um, the issues are addressed and that timeline is uh, over. Uh, we will also be um, looking at um, requiring transient occupancy tax. Uh, that TOT is already in the books, but we will have to make our, the zoning code consistent with the tax code, so they, they will not be any contract. Other revisions, uh, as mentioned before, tax code would probably have to be tweaked. We would need to create the registry database, but uh, how we're doing, we're looking at how we're doing it. Are we gonna create a one-stop shop where someone would be able to come in and apply for a permit, address the tax 
uh, issue and um, I just in, in the registry as well. Um, other any applicable zoning ordinance would also have to be um, revised to be consistent with the standards we will be coming up with. Uh, we have additional co um, information about what the, our next steps would be. We are planning on going before the Planning Commission for a workshop on November 1st. Uh, the Planning Commission will discuss the issue with staff and may open it up for comments from the public. This is not a public hearing. There will not be any decisions made, but it is just a workshop where they will address the um, uh, straw man that we will be coming up with once we have this discussion. So we don't have too many people, so yeah. we can, uh, you know, go informal on questions or comments or whatever anything anybody wants to say about where we are. Your hands up first, as always. Go ahead. <laughs> no, <wait. laughs> uh, what are the similarities and the differences between allowing something to be done by waiver versus by right? Well, we don't have a waiver. A waiver exception. Okay, exception. so by a special exception or a special permit, so we we have. A special exception process and a special permit process. Um, the special exception is a process that goes to the Planning Commission and the Board and they review an application that's subject to a lot of standards and a lot of submission requirements and there's a public hearing for that use. The special permit is an application that goes to the Board of Zoning Appeals, different body, um, and it's just a one-stop public hearing, but that, that's the main difference, is any of those uh, special exception or special permit is a public hearing process that's discretionary. You know, it's you can get it approved or not. By right is if you meet the criteria, you get approved. It's not really discretionary. You have to meet whatever criteria is established, and then it has to be approved. So. And what impact are there on uh, the ability to enforce on either of those? Um, in some ways, they're similar. What happens with special exceptions and special permits is that either of the two boards approves conditions with it that sort of become the regulations that are attached to it. So people have to comply with those. So you still have to sort of do the inspections and make sure, you know, that if you think somebody's violating, you have to prove they're violating or whatever. Same with by right. I mean, if there's standards attached to a use that's by right, you still have to still have to investigate and make sure that people are complying with them. Um, so it's kind of the same process, but the basis of those rules is different. One's sort of a set of conditions, and one stuff that's in the zoning ordinance. Do all three of them, since it's exception by, <clears throat> or special exception, special permit, and by right, do all three of them allow uh, enforcement personnel to go inspect in the home? Yeah. Well, but by right, if we've given some kind of permit for something, most of those permits say on them that it allows for the right of entry right. Um, for an inspection. Okay. Um, you know, Peggy, Peggy can probably tell you that's not always the case. You can't always get on a piece of property. Um, I know with special exceptions and, and special permits, that's built into the process, is that we have the right to, you know, ensure that you're complying with whatever got approved. Um, but that doesn't make it an easy task. No, right, yeah. but easy. But there is a there is a difference then by, between the by right and the special exceptions. Of the, the true ability of being able to get on a property to enforce the code. There is a difference between those two. Well, our home occupation permits, which are by right permits mm -hmm. to allow certain businesses in the home, um, have as part of the limitations and conditions that says that the county has the ability to. Um, come into the property on, uh, on a reasonable basis. So if we go and we get a complaint and, and DCC goes and knocks on the door and they don't let us in, well, that's just, that's a violation of the conditions because they're supposed Regardless to. Regardless of where the conditions are. Right, right because it's right in, that is right in the zoning ordinance. It, it doesn't carry more yeah. weight one over the other. It's no, okay. no, it's just in a different place. And one of the things we have to do with this, we're not likely to include it as a special permit. We're going to create it as its own permit, as mm -hmm. sort of a, you know, short-term lodging permit. And that would be something that would be built into that permit form. By signing this, you give us the right of entry upon reasonable notification or whatever the language is. So. I have a question. So the survey, how uh, do you assimilate the answers and the responses you got of the survey into what the actual code will be? We, like, uh, I mean, there were 28% who was 
strongly opposed, right? So yes, yes, and all of that has already been given to the board. Will be given to the board again when we develop our staff report, mm -hmm. um, and is absolutely within. I mean, they are within their rights to say, "Yeah, we're not doing this. We're going to continue to disallow these." So that okay. that is a possibility. They've already gotten the survey results and are aware that that's been the response rate. Um, we got. I mean, it's not a majority, almost 3,300. Uh, right. You know, you might, I would suggest that you go to, and I don't know if we have it on our website, but we met with the board on October 3rd, presented something very similar to this. We gave the board a list of questions. You know, what do you, you know, what do you want us to do on this? Where, where do you think? And I would urge you, it's, it's taped. You can go online to the board, it's 30 of, minutes. It's not too long. board okay. of supervisors um, website and then yes. look click on the committees, look at the development process, and okay. it'll be there. And so this, this um, there's a printout of this PowerPoint okay. attached, and if you go to this link, there is an actual link to, to the board's okay. and you can And you can kind of hear what the board members have to say. I mean, I, I would say generally, most of the board members are, you know, begrudgingly, if you will, you know, they're they don't like the idea of, of these things coming into the neighborhoods, but I think the recognition is they're, they're not going. Something. They're not going away, and so they need to do something. I think there was right. also a, a feeling that there was concern about it being the principal residence of someone if we're going to allow it, and that they don't want to turn it into a commercial situation. I mean, that that kind of. They, they were the, fairly consistent on that. Yes, All of them yes, were fairly consistent yes, about yes. having to live. And in no event, and no no events, and you know, mm -hmm. using it for weddings or other kinds of, of things. Now there is a you know we do have an, and we may be making some tweaks to our bed and breakfast provisions where someone could come in and get a special exception to have a bed and breakfast, which is more of a commercial operation, but that's an approval that. A legislative approval by the board so I you know and maybe we're looking at some tiered you know options but but again I think that's a good you know look at that video and and I think um, so, I'm so you just go, go back to the survey though so out of um, how many people could have possibly answered that survey and we only had 7,000 so how many that, that's actually the survey? highest response rate of any survey the county really has ever been done. How many <laughs> ever on any topic? Really? Yes. Ever on any topic. I'm impressed that we got that. <laughs> many, <laughs> how many people could have responded? A million. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. There's, there's, there's like, I don't know. I mean, adults wise. It would have been even more than that because we yeah. from Arlington. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, right. It was open for anybody yeah, yeah, who wanted yeah. to respond to it. And one person could do a multiple time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. If they have multiple really? devices, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you have to have multiple devices. Uh, I mean, yeah. that's the problem with any survey. It was a tool that we were using. Again, it's just one one of the... I know, but Leslie, you keep saying that, but you... We have three community but, meetings but, where but, we've taken a lot of... Yeah, meetings. I know, and I've been at three of these four meetings you've had. And the problem is, is just to be honest about it, I mean, it was a flawed survey. And it was said to be one of many tools, but you keep using the survey results as the primary influencer to, to this I, I meeting. So unless you go and listen to the board members, all they're hearing from you has basically been about that survey. So you know, they're uh, hearing from their own So the survey, I mean, yeah, half I the people don't want any limiters on the number of nights. 90% so of your presentation not. to the board and to the planning committee has been on this survey. And you haven't been real clear about the fallacies of it. I've talked to three professionals about the survey. I'm past the survey, but I think a lot of people haven't studied it. Like, it was a flawed survey. That doesn't make it bad. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have used it. It is a tool, and I think the response rate is really great. But it did differ in the responses you got at a couple of meetings, like we said, with the little dot, and you did a great job on that. I think it really got people to focus. For those of you who don't know, at the other meetings, they had this little dot, and you would go in the room, and based on what they got from the survey, they had like 10 or 12 boards, and you got five dots, and you'd draw five on one issue if that was the issue that was concerning to you. So these I'm are, saying yeah. you guys have done a great job, and then, I mean, wait, it's obvious this has been needed. But that survey, I'm not criticizing you, it was flawed. And to use that, when we're told by the board supervisor, because I've written to all of them, and Penny Gross is mine, and she says, well, it's just one tool. But all you've reported this is about well, no, not at all because we're, we're trying to report all everything that's come out of the, the meetings that we've had. 
Um, we are also reporting to them on what other jurisdictions have done. Um, you know, we, we are gathering, as we've gotten data, we have reported to them. So when the survey closed in August, we reported the survey results to them. We will report, well, we've already reported three meetings worth, and then they added this fourth one, but we'll report the, the results of four meetings to them as well. We, we are, we're getting them the information as we can. We did just at the Development Process Committee, that's online too, right, the jurisdictions, we did a table, a summary of jurisdictions that we've looked at. I mean, so we're, we're gathering data and providing it to them. No, and I, I but the staff report super job. is where all of that stuff you've will come together. You've been very open. You've been very yeah. good about responding. I mean, but I just, I have to agree, people that have looked at the survey, professionals, have said it really shouldn't have gotten out of the gate like it did. But no, I, hey, you guys are, you know, you've been very open and I, I, I can congratulate you on that. I mean, there's obviously, this has been a touch button. People are here and here on this issue, and, that, and that's what we have to write regulations that, you know, is something that for the board to consider um, to give them an opportunity to decide what it is they want as a county. What do they want to allow for? Um, I'm, I'm going to guess that it's going to be a baby step into this, see how it goes, and maybe a step further down the road. I don't know, but um, as many jurisdictions, San Francisco kind of threw the door open. Arlington a little bit through the door open. I don't know that we will ever reach that that level here. Certainly not in the first step. I don't believe we're headed in that direction. But in Arlington, uh, sorry, in Arlington right now, short-term rental is uh, legal and everybody and mm -hmm. there is no problem. But in Fairfax County, it's 30 days or more. Correct. It's 30 days or less. Yeah. Long term yeah. rentals. For, for the amount of nights. Yeah. Yeah. You're allowed to do 30 days or more, but yet in Arlington, you can do short term rentals. and One uh, night at a time. One yeah. night at a time yeah. in Arlington, yeah. And in Fairfax, it has to be 30, 30 nights or more. 30 nights. It's not considered short term. Right. Yeah. So month to month rentals, essentially, if you think of that right. way. Month to month yeah. rental is legit. So that's legit. Lot. Yeah. And anything less than that is considered short term. And Arlington's not all well because of their their their, their compliance ratio was horrible. They had at one time listed 1,600 units. They've had less than 150 registered. Right. They're only trickling so in. So yeah. it's people are still acting as though it doesn't exist. So it they have regs in. They beat the General Assembly passing the bill, but they're having problems. And that's something that we will be looking at as part of this whole package, of you know how we do track these and with the registry and what have you and there are um, we're looking at different um, companies that the county may want to um, engage with to provide us information so that you know we, we, we can periodically take a look at that. One of the things that you did that you didn't mention is that you took all those comments and divided it out. 900 or whatever comments. 3,295. <laughs> we read every Sorry. one and classified each one. Yeah. See, now, you know, better than sheep, huh? That, that adds a lot to what you've done, right. so please don't forget right. to say that. Yeah, that was where we got a lot of meat. You know, a yeah. lot of meat that wasn't, we only had 10 questions that we asked, and they were specifically to help us define what parameters we should come up with, you know, this end or this end, and then advertise a big range. But we got the you know the real meat of it in the comment section. Right. So. Well, I uh, I've received a lot of comments, and if it's okay, I'd like to just take a few minutes and tell you what I've been hearing. Uh, most people that have contacted me are not supportive of doing this in single family detached neighborhoods. Uh, their concern is about strangers in the area and not knowing who's going in and out of the next door, especially if the owner is not there and they're concerned about having their kids play in the yard and they have strangers coming in and we don't know who they are. Um, so it's really a safety issue more than anything else and to be able to use their property. Um, the parking issue was a big one also um, because we have that 10 foot requirement for the driveway and as it is, people don't need that. Um, they block driveways anyway, but in our situation, uh, we have uh, lots of streets without curb and gutter. You know, so you shouldn't be parking there anyway. And we also don't have water. So if there's a, a fire or something that you need water, we don't have fire hydrants. And yeah. yep. They're well accepted. Oh, yeah. Well accepted. Yeah. The what? Well, well accepted. accepted. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So the, well, you know, the, county, well, the county's answer is it's okay, we have water trucks. But what if a water truck is in Morton when we need water, you know? 
And so we're having a very hard time with the water party trying to get them to clean in fire hydrants. Uh, so that is just one aspect of not every neighborhood has that issue. But that's something that uh, we have to deal with. Also, um, that this is really a business. And it should have all the same things attached to it that a business has. They should have to pay personal property tax on everything they use in the business, just like the neighbor next door who has a consulting company in her house or his house or whatever. So it's personal property tax, people, the whole gamut. Um, you said uh, you were concerned about commercial events. Well, we deal with commercial events. We've had Kima Temple next door to us. And even though they have conditions that say no commercial events and they have to contact us before they can do this, that, and the other, it's easy to say, but very difficult. They're not supposed to advertise, but yet they advertise a rock and roll band festival. You know, you, you, I don't know how you stay on top of it, so that's the next question. How do you enforce all of this? Um, I, I don't know. That is a major challenge. Right now we have regulations that say you can't do it. And you know, look on Airbnb and you'll see plenty of them that are doing this. So we have, um, I think Peggy said we're up to 45-ish on the addresses. 45 that, cases we've investigated. Yeah, that we're currently currently, uh, have, currently uh, looking at. open ones. Mm -hmm. So it's, I mean, the, the challenge is that you need to have enough evidence. Sure. Um, that is defensible in court. Otherwise, we've wasted your money by taking something to court that's not winnable. So, you know, a neighbor writing down license numbers without knowing if that's the mother-in-law or the friend or the whatever, you know, while that gives you a piece of information in and of itself, it isn't the defensible, you know, argument that you can make. So that is absolutely a challenge. And as Leslie mentioned, there's a number of companies that have sort of sprung out of all of this. They're kind of data mining companies that can get information from these platforms that can provide us with things like how many nights it was, you know, booked up and whatever else. And when the actual address is, you don't get an actual address until you pay your money. Um, so there, there are a number of challenges to enforcement, which is one of the things we're very cognizant about in writing this, is we don't want to write a bunch of, but we're not looking to search everybody's house to see how many people are there and how many bedrooms are there and how many nights you live there, that sort of thing. So we're not trying to make it so onerous that it can't be enforced, but it needs to be, you know, so innocuous that it fits into a neighborhood without, you know, without causing a problem for the neighborhood. And that is the balance we are trying to, very uh, difficult. to find. It is very difficult. And, and many jurisdictions, we're part of a multi-jurisdictional team um, from a lot of places around Virginia, and everybody is in the same boat. Now, some care less about it than we do. Fairfax is a little concerned about it more so than some other places. but. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of all tiptoeing around. Loudon is about to propose something to their board, see what they want to do. So we're all kind of in the same boat with the same challenges that we're sharing information about. Do you expect Richmond to bring something up on that Absolutely, again? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Well, we're, we're hoping that, we're hoping not, because they gave the localities the ability to regulate this at the last session. And so, you know, we're, we're looking at trying to move this so that, you know. If they do something, we want to be We want to already have that. something in place or be close yeah. to having something in place. I mean, it's come up every year since, what, 15? There's been something pending around down there. So, you know, you don't know what's going to come up in Richmond, but you can pretty much be guaranteed something will. Well, they put it in the bill. They're going to redo it this year. So mm -hmm. they, they left that door open mm -hmm. to step back in. Right. So, and that, I mean, that's a little bit of a challenge for us, too. We do not want to lose authority to regulate Oh, absolutely not. Um, that, I don't know, that's good for anybody. Um, so, that's kind of what we're looking at. Oh, so they could enforce state law over this? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, absolutely. That was yeah. the first proposal. That was one of the original proposals, and local jurisdictions hands off was sort of that okay. proposal, and that meant, you know, nobody happy. in the state of Virginia did anything. Mm -hmm. The beach and the mountains. Mm -hmm. and no, yeah. it's called the Dillon Road, Virginia, Virginia mm -hmm. State Law. They very much like keeping control of the police, mm -hmm. so that was a big, big thing. Yeah. Can I ask if the, um, the state law specifically says that their professionals that are managing property don't have to register? So if you come up with a register, how will a county and citizens, ind individual citizens, know where properties are that are managed by these professionals? 
Well, that's what interesting. With, that, with, with an occupancy requirement, um, you will need to live there. So it's not like, I mean, if, if anybody, you go to the beach and you rent from, you know, Joe Realty Company or whatever, and you don't have any idea who owns that. You've just gone to the realtor and gotten your keys and given them your money. Mm -hmm. So that's not the case that can happen here. You have to live in your unit and you, you have to be a resident of that unit. Um, to the extent that somebody could have somebody managing it for them, I don't know that we've, we've uh, sort of gotten to that point right. to consider what that could look like, but it has to be a, a owner-occupied primary residence mm -hmm. of somebody, as opposed to, you know, a management company that, you know, right. buys up a bunch and... So in the case of a, a couple of comments at a couple of the other community meetings, where the one fellow in particular said, well, I have eight to ten houses for military that have moved out, so he could easily have somebody rent that while they're as their primary and then they could do STR in it. So he so those are the issues that we know how creative people are about yeah. this rule. Um, and we some of us have had to live next door to some of these creative individuals. So I just I think that that's one of the rules because that in the state law is a huge call that can be manipulated easily. And that's sort of the Virginia Beach rule it seems. I mean that's those areas that typically have what I would consider sort that of the vacation, vacation rental time right. which is to me different from a short term that's rental. Right. It's a little bit of a different and a lot product. of people think that because you put yeah. it you have to be primary owner, oh that's, that's all taken <coughs> care of. And primary residency requirement. Yeah, and resident it should be yeah. right hundred and eighty eighty five days right. out of the well, year. But we know like I said that the person mm -hmm. renting those or managing those nine homes could Rent the home to someone who then that would be the they would become the operator. Yeah, as and long as that person lived there, you yeah, know, right. kind of full time, then that is right. very likely. So you know. I think that, you know, once again, is just know that that's a huge hole that mm -hmm. I think is could be easily used. Unfortunately, I think the holes will show up as we start to implement. Yeah, there's plenty of other towns that have already found them. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Does anybody else have? There was, yeah, on this side. I have a question, and then you talk to the, like you've talked about like having a tiered system, like how far have you thought about like revising the bed and breakfast provision, and, and is that something that you're planning to do these dual track, or are you just going to deal with the short term rental and then something else? No, we, we definitely think we'll be doing it all at the same time. One of the main things about the bed and breakfast, we have exactly zero in Fairfax County, there are no bed and breakfast that have been approved in Fairfax, that are operating, there was one approved whatever year it was in the 80s or 90s or something, um, it's $16,375 just to apply. Not to mention the materials that you have to bring in, which probably runs you another five grand. So it's a very expensive application just to apply, not knowing if you'll get approved. So that's clearly something we need to take a look at. Because um, there are probably locations in Fairfax County that are highly appropriate for a bed and breakfast, like a, a genuine, you know, what you think of, as a bed and breakfast commercial operation. So it so, has to be zoned first, right? It would, it would get a special exception in that case. Oh, yeah, okay. it would be approved by the board. Yeah, it's public the neighbors and the works. So yeah. it cannot be in a neighborhood where you have a neighborhood. Not like this, no. Because one of the criteria on a special exception is that the use that you're proposing and you know all of the things that go with it need to be in compliance with the conference yeah. plan. And right. you typically yeah. wouldn't find language in the plan if you're plopped in the middle of a neighborhood. Um, it probably is not going to support that. Um, because it is a commercial use. Nobody has to live there. It's a, it's a commercial um, venture. She, she okay. had her hand up. Yeah, this is my first time coming to, to this meeting. Well, well. Nice, but, yeah. So it's currently illegal to rent to someone with Airbnb less than 30 days? Correct. Mm -hmm. You can rent through Airbnb for more than 30 more days at a time, and people do do that. Um, so it's not the platform itself. It's just the term. It's just the 30-day okay. term that's magic here. So, so um, to follow up on that, so if you are in violation, and you said you're investigating 45 cases right now, so what is the penalty? Is anything like determined? Um, How does that work? Well, we, we okay. haven't, we don't have 45, we've investigated 45 cases. Oh, okay. We currently have, I think, 15, 16 cases open. Yeah. And we've issued three notices of violation. And then what? Um, well, one of them actually, one um, he decided he complied. He actually is running it long term. Okay. Um, he didn't know about the right rules. Well, and that's a lot of it too. Yeah, it's just get educating more, people. Right. Once we tell them, you know, it's illegal, you right. can't do this. A lot of people say, okay, fine, and they rent it full time. So a lot of it's just education, which we do if you go out to these places. And then two of them have been appealed. So um, it's kind of a stay right now of um, any more enforcement action. 
it's been appealed to the Board of Zoning Appeals. But is that something you're working on with the legislation? Mm -hmm. Like there will be well, I think fines put in place? Well, or? There, are fines. there are fines. There are fines. There are, yeah. there are fines, fines built into okay. the state code that if you if we come up with a registry and you're not registered, it's a $500 fine okay. that could be issued. We're also looking at, you know, we want people to come into, if we're going to adopt something, I think, you know, the other thing we may be looking at is a grace period of some point to say, okay, you know, the, you know, we're going to give you three months or whatever that time frame is to, to get it registered, to bring yourself into compliance. I mean, Arlington did that. A lot of jurisdictions do they, they give you a period of time. So as of a certain date, if you're not registered, then you know, your subject, you may be opening yourself up for, um, you know, the fine and for uh, a notice of violation. Um, because not being on the registry would be a violation of probably how we structure it would be a violation of the zoning ordinance. And then, you know, what we typically do is, I mean, it's a, that's a $500 uh, fine. And then just uh, normal zoning violations are $250 civil penalties. I mean, we try to get compliance, so. Okay. What would per offense be? Would it be per night? I mean, when you say per offense. Per rental, it could be per rental, yeah. So is it per rental or is it per night that it's being rented? Well, if you have a contract to rent for the weekend, that's probably an offense. Huh. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Just, yeah. But if you had two different groups running for one night, yeah. that would be two offenses. Because yeah. some of these people are making 60000 a year, 125000 a year, the ones that are really pushing this. So with $500 slap on their wrist is right. So I you know I, you gotta be when you until you seen this and lived with it, it it you, you Well that limit's not ours. That's in the code. No, uh, no I know so the actually both of the limits are in the code. I right? actually want to follow up I want to follow up, um, yeah. follow up um, her comment. Um yeah. You said that one of the things that the uh, neighbors were complaining is the fact that, you know, strangers are coming into the neighborhood and I guess uh, you feel that it's a little unsafe maybe. Do you think that the 30 days limit will change that? No. Right. And this isn't my... No, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just thinking, you know, how 30 days, you know, becoming long-term rental, 30 days or more, will change what the neighbors feel. Well, you know, if, if the rental, if it's a, a rental where you have a, a lease agreement kind of thing, there's more of a likelihood that you will meet your neighbor because they will be there for more than 30 days. But this other thing where you're renting for a day or two or a night, you'll see them once and never see them again. And what I'm hearing is people are concerned about having their children play outside when they don't know what's happening next door. So do you think 30 days um, will make a difference? But everything is registered through Airbnb with all their information. And, and Airbnb so run below you know, their credit, yeah, yeah, you know, everything. They don't yeah. always know yeah. that. They don't know. No. The neighbors don't know that. And they don't register all the guests that show up from all these places. So four people may register, and suddenly the owner's not there. The owners, you'll see it all the time on the comments, but they're only supposed to have six people, and I found 20 at the house. So I understand what you're saying, but there's a lot of miscommunication there. that. And you know, it's kind of like cancer. You're told, oh, this, this tumor's only 3% chance. And it's, until you're at that 3% chance, it becomes 100%. So I don't say that, you know, it's illegal, and so everybody who's operating is operating legal, but I'm not saying everybody's bad. But when you've experienced the bad, it's really bad. Sorry. Other. What happened on the spot? It went beyond parking. We had people staring at us. And remember, these are, a lot of them are vacationers. So if I'm working an 8 5 or whatever job, they're out there vacationing. Some noise. Uh, neighbor who doesn't even talk to us suddenly evacuates. We thought he was just a really nice person. We really moved in, had a lot of folks over. But suddenly we realized he wasn't there. And when we had problems, so kids running in the yard, playing t ball in the front yard of a neighbor. You name it. And, and yes, they can have their own party if they live there. But, you know, quite honestly, I speed. I break the law. I know I'm breaking the law when I speed. But I know I'm breaking the law and I'm going to pay the penalty. And enforcement can't keep up with it. So the, the thing I asked about is insurance. Nothing's been addressed about insurance. Everybody I didn't hear anything bad that happened. Though. I asked you. What was bad that happened to you? Oh, that sounds bad. And, hey, what, what, well, what how is about it? the what noise? How about the, the noise? Yeah. Yeah. noise? 
And how about breaking the yeah. law? Is that not bad? Yeah. No, that sounds very bad. Well, I was just wondering that you know, breaking negative law. story besides noise. Because I mean, you have a neighbor that's noisy. I'm no, sure. I, I mean, I have yeah. neighbors that are noisy. Well, who's my neighbor? I've had a neighbor. I've had a neighbor that's a drug dealer. You Where know. Do you live? Uh, I live in Alexandria. Can I, how do you people, dress there's, insurance? There's bad people everywhere. Sir, it doesn't matter can you dress if you're insurance, Airbnb or, or a neighbor. The state never addressed that. I never got the final there's, there's one. There's bad people everywhere. Whoa, 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 whoa. Can you finish your comment? Yeah. You guys act like these people from Airbnb are like lawbreakers and are terrible people. Not only and, and, nobody and else what I'm trying to explain to you guys is I've been doing Airbnb that. out of my house for a long time. Illegally. And the Illegally. people Illegally. the people that stay in my house no, are no, family people. Law. That's correct. They're family people with children. The people that stay in my house from Airbnb are better than tenants that rented my house before. So I just don't understand because I really haven't heard any credible complaints. Have you looked on the internet about some of the complaints about some of the complaints of other areas? I, I'm, I'm sure members. even some of uh, the people from Fairfax County could tell you about some of the other areas that, where they've had problems. Now, not everyone who does this is, is going to be a problem. Or not, not, but you, is, now you understand, understand our but, dilemma. But, yeah. you, but, but so you have to have to this place. So yeah. Yeah. But 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 nobody is saying I don't think they're going to have a place. Yeah, 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 it's sure. tough. Yeah. I agree. I, I agree that the people should register without question. So if you do have a problem, you can solve it right away. I agree 100%. But does that happen? Yeah. Yes. Well, so, even if it doesn't happen, let's say it doesn't happen. If the people are breaking the law, it's very easy for you to call the police and have them arrested. You're breaking the law. Well, he's now. breaking the law. I, I'm not talking. This is <laughs> brand new. Airbnb has it's been going on. Airbnb law. and Home it's Away, law. just so I can say, has been going on in this area for years. Okay. But it's only for now. years. Now and we're and we're okay. trying to now now that, to that establish you know, some it, it's still in the gray area. No 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 real laws have been passed yet, and that's why we're all here to discuss the new laws that will go into effect. But it's just interesting to me how you guys are basically you know I haven't heard since Airbnb has been going on for years. I haven't heard anything negative, like bad, that has happened, except for a regular complaint that you would get with your neighbor, as far as noise, parking. I've had my neighbors park in my driveway. I mean, it happens. But what I'm trying to say is, is that there's more positive for the Airbnb than there is negative. It's going to create more tax dollars for the government and yeah. helps the local business it, it helps the local businesses out That's when these people enormous. come here to spend money it I mean it's a the hotel industry, industry, the hotel industry no. does you, people that go to Airbnb and rent out homes are usually big families that can't fit in a hotel box okay so those people want to be able to have the room and they want to have a kitchen. They want to have a big house so the whole family can be together. Okay? And that's why it just, it's, it's, it's just interesting to me that all the years that Airbnb has been in business in this area, I haven't heard any credible complaints. I'm going to just get the law. We're going to move on to about um, so we are, we have heard from both sides again when we did the survey and at the community meetings. It, you know, there are concerns, the parking concern, neighborhood character, noise, trash, safety, those are valid concerns that we've heard. And by the same token, we've heard from people that are operating Airbnb who've had positive experiences and who say their neighbors have had positive experiences as well. What we're trying to come up with it is a regulation that would preserve neighborhood character, but also allow some type of you know, uh, short-term rentals and come up with a regulation that would address these concerns and, and violations. But before I let you continue, I just wanted to mention that Jay Doshi, our tax 
uh, department director, it would be leaving at 8.15. If you have any tax-related questions, you can ask them also. You can, can I ask one question real fast first? Um, the community I live in is mostly townhomes, so we have families living close to each other. And um, most of the people in my community would prefer not to have short-term rentals, but if we do, we would really like for the owner operator to be at home. Because we have, the way it is now, we can just go next door or go down the street. Everyone has a good rapport. And um, we can just talk to the people. But if they're not home and we have to call the police or go through, you know, bureaucratic red tape or whatever, it just makes it so much difficult, much more Why difficult. Why can't you talk to the Airbnb renter? When, they're, when they change every three to four days, that means that now... Have you told you about community issues? Yes. Oh, not if they were making a noise. Okay. Oh, or if they're making a noise, I would talk to them. So right, I was right. talking, if, okay. you know, different community issues. Right. Any tax questions before Jay has to take off? Uh, yeah. Well, I just want to be sure that the things we're talking about, like personal property tax, et cetera, can be enforced and you would move forward with that. Just like you would if I had a consulting uh, business in my house, I have to pay personal property tax on my land. So, you know, it should be carried the same way. So I want to be sure, you talk about land, man? No, I'm, talk, I'm talking about, about personal property. I understand, but when you said personal property for land, no, no, no. A lamp. I a lamp. Sure, I understand. Lamp. Oh, lamp. I get it. Okay, lamp. that's fine. <laughs> I get it. Thank you. Sorry. I do need to get my hearing check. <laughs> uh, once again, my name is Shay Doshi. I work with the, the Department of Tax Administration. I, I appreciate the question. At this stage, my sense is for sure the depot tax, the business license taxes, and the transient occupancy taxes will be As you might know, we poll taxes if you gross under ten thousand dollars, you do not pay anything. If it's between ten and fifty thousand dollars, it's a flat fee about thirty dollars a week in this. And up to hundred thousand dollars it's fifty dollars. So most folks who are Airbnb over hosts would fall in on less than hundred thousand dollars range. For the most part, therefore you're looking at the registry and collecting transient occupancy taxes and a flat fee of some kind. When it comes to tangible personal property taxes, it gets pretty messy. No kidding. Yes. Okay. Because what we're discussing then is, depending on what the board decides, how many days, whether the owner is present or not, whether we make a distinction based on that in the ordinance, etc. Therefore, my initial inclination, ultimately, taxation is about number six or seven or eight when it comes to community concerns. This is not a money maker. It may generate some revenue for the county, but it's not. But what you're talking about is equity, and I get that. What I would offer to you is this. I think we're going to be careful because it's back to what we've said all along, which is we're not interested in coming in and surveying someone's lab or desk that is used 12 days out of 365. That, that, that doesn't pass the smell test when it comes to tax and property. Most other taxes that can be cleanly administered, ultimately what we don't want to do is to set people up for failure. Well, so we want to administer taxes that are reasonable, that are fair, that can be consistent to you. But I think if you don't go forward with personal property tax, annual personal property tax, for this, then you should change it for all the others. Why should I be paying a tax on my land? Well, if you have a land that you're using in business 365 days a year, I would argue that's different from someone who's hosting uh, another person for 10 days or 10 days. Well, I, I, I don't intend to necessarily, you know, have a long Different localities are still evaluating what the approach will be. 
I'm just giving you an initial sense. Whatever's on the books, I prefer that it be something that we can administer fairly and that we can apply equitably to it. I think that's key. Right now, I'm concerned that it's not going to be an equitable thing. But and, and, just so and, that you know where I'm from. And I, and, I totally, and I totally understand that. All I can tell you is that at least the, the, the range of options that may be presented may not have anything that exceeds 183 days of rental for a property. Okay. That meets you more than half test as an example. So uh, we have an open mind. The board has to decide, but I'm giving you my initial impression of what's reasonable and what's over here. Well, that's part of the reason question is up there. Yes, ma'am. Because it is a difficult situation to deal with, but it should be fair. If yes. If the consultant has to pay it, then this is another business well, maybe next door. Well, it's respectfully, if the consultant is working, you know, it owns the business 365 days a year, I don't equate it as the same um, as as necessarily someone who is doing short-term rentals. Again, that question is open, the approaches are different, and I absolutely hear you on the question um, of tangible personal property taxes. To me, as I, we have heard, we go out of our way to ensure that we listen to others who, like us, are attempting to address the issue, and personal property tax, to be honest, does not even come up in this discussion. Well, that's my no, I, I get that. I, I totally yeah, get that. that. Okay. Yeah. But what I'm also trying to tell you is some of these have been extensive meetings. There are a number of issues that are far more important to the community at large that need to be addressed. Well, I hear you and I appreciate yes, what you're saying. But I think some of the comments that we got about the survey was the fact that it didn't mention some of these things. They didn't talk about parking. They didn't talk about taxes and all of that sort of stuff. So it wasn't until after people had a chance to digest the survey and to talk to other people that they said, oh, gee, what about noise or whatever the thing was that bugged me. So um, I agree, may not be the most important thing out there, but if we keep saying, and the Board of Supervisors, I've heard a number of them say, we have to be treat everybody the same and all this other stuff, then let's well, there'll be a chapter in the staff report on taxes. Yeah. So we will, we will definitely have that conversation. And, and there'll be opportunities to comment as well. Yes, well, ma'am. this will all be subject to a public hearing before. Right. So That's you right. all will have an opportunity to come out and speak yes. to that. So and during the General Assembly debate on this subject um, last year, there were several comments made that renting isn't a business. And because a lot of people try to say this is a business and they come back from some of the web platform and in particular Airbnb is this is not a business, this is renting. And you don't you don't you don't necessarily treat um, if I rent my house out, is that a business tax? Um, so how is this looked at if it's renting, is it considered a business? And it is a business tax applicable. So so to, to, versus to, TOT. To, to take your to take your questions one by one. Um, at this stage, the approach that we're seeing throughout the Commonwealth, for the most part, does treat this activity as one that is subject to a business license, assuming there's a local ordinance. Okay. And I do anticipate that that is where the discussion might start in Fairfax County. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, your other question was about TOT. Um, and TOT, as well, I would say to you that what we have seen of the ordinances that are in place in Virginia, and quite frankly across the nation, um, whatever form of transient occupancy tax, sorry, I use the short form, it's transient occupancy tax, anything that we pay in the present the state. That would also apply. Do boarding houses pay TOT? Boarding houses may have different limits. I don't know the answer to your question. <coughs> I think ultimately the task when it comes to as the occupancy tax is the length of the stay. Okay. If you cease being a short term renter, and I'm using that word loosely, not the way we're trying to use it here, then the, 
transient. Again, remember, it's transient occupancy tax. So if we sort of start from that premise that it is truly a transient, if they stay more than, and generally I think 30 is accepted, but the ordinances will change that, then no local taxes will apply. Okay. I, stay more than 30 days, no, yes, no TOT tax. Right. So the boarding house, or like if you said earlier, Airbnb, some of them rent for more than 30 days under Airbnb, then they would have to separate those out. Separate those out. Yes, That's a month to month rental. Right yeah. And has uh, Fairfax County been in conversation with the various platforms about them paying taxes on behalf of these people? So I can explain that. We can't. There's something called a voluntary collection agreement. Mm -hmm. um, at this point in time, I am not recommending that Fairfax County go that way. And the reason is simple. Uh, at this point in time, it would appear that um, the Airbnbs of the world would not provide us the name and the address. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And therefore, that would be a significant concern, especially from a zoning perspective or code compliance perspective. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Very Were you much. just testing me? Yes, I was. Thank you. Okay. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> We're doing our homework. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Laura, you asked a question about insurance. Um, you know, that's really way outside the scope of the zoning ordinance, but it's definitely something that, you know, maybe the zoning ordinance can't require somebody to have insurance for something. That's not what we do. It's just a land use thing. Um, but it's definitely come up. I mean, it's come up a number of times. People have been concerned about, um, you know, somebody in the home getting hurt, somebody renting, damaging property, somebody right. renting, damaging community property. Or damaging um, the next door neighbor's property, or on right. their property getting right. hurt and then suing the neighbor. So, you know, so we've heard a lot about the concerns that relate back to insurance, and, and while that's outside the scope of the zoning ordinance, we are still trying to understand it, it better, to find out from insurer, insurers, um, what, what do you do when somebody walks in and says, yeah, I live in this house, but I also do Airbnb. Is there some rider? Do they have to pay extra? Do they have to get some policy coverage? You know, I, I don't know what that does to a homeowners association's community property, your swimming pool, your right. playground, your whatever. So we are we are working to, to um, find those answers, but I, I don't well, think... There's an open question that the General Assembly, that Virginia is being regulated their own insurance as a state, that if, even if the Airbnb policy, in fact, covers these folks, making them think that it does, but it doesn't cover all of this. And even the insurance company spoke up and said, well, not always is our policy included, but hey, we can find a new, and I mean, they literally stated in the meeting, and it, I think it's on tape, I think it's one of the tape, but well, this is a new business area. We find a new rider to put on your policy, absolutely. I can help sure you out with that. With for more money, yeah, yeah, right. Because your insurance won't cover short-term rentals, you know? So I pay extra, okay, double what I was paying before for the extra insurance to cover short-term rentals. But not all the insurance companies do that. So you, you're familiar with your insurance, but they actually sat around the table and said not all of them are the same. Right. I think they right. just come there around is, too there is, There's not a lot of them because it's new, just right. like Uber, right. you know, the whole insurance. But it's not likely to end up in a zoning right. ordinance just because that's outside the scope. You of can't say that they have to carry a land insurance. use, land use related things. You know, that's not for me. I got no problem. So the regulations won't carry right. right. I mean, if you put a trampoline in your backyard, I'm responsible. I'm out. I'm out. If we put a trampoline. you burn down your house, you know, you're not covered. Okay. okay. If you put a trampoline or a swimming pool in your backyard, we'll tell you where it can go in terms of its setbacks and everything. Right. But chances are good your insurance company wants to know about that as well. We don't do anything about that. And this would be sort of along those same lines. There are things that present a, a hazard outside of the normal course of having a house. <laughs> Some dogs you can get in for insurance, you know, I mean, that sort of thing. So it's kind of in that category that we would not want to wade into. Well, we recognize it's come up, and even though some of the board members have asked questions about it, so we'll make sure we have the answers for them. And I don't think you'll see a provision about that. I don't know if that will make. I mean, we may do now. as part of a, you know, just an information flyer saying, you know, that's something that you. Oh, by the way, check. you need to check with your insurer. So uh, I think we make it a neighbor who have people creeping through my yard, and they can fall and they can sue me. I don't have any any ability to find out whether or not they have the appropriate insurance other than going and asking them and these people don't even talk to us. That I don't know. I, yeah, yeah, I don't know how you would. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I don't, again, 
captured your comment, but I don't know that that is something that we would put into a regulation that says, because what am I going to do? You know, they're going to provide, I, I don't want to be the, we're doing the registry, let's, we don't want to have to say, no, show us your, your insurance policy. No, I understand your position, but I'm also flipping that a lot of the misnomer there be, oh, we cover insurance. Well, the fact has been shown, no, that doesn't cover everything. And the other problem is people who lost platforms. Does VRBO carry? Does Craigslist carry? Right, yeah, it's a lot of platforms. And Airbnb has over promoted what they cover as, oh, it's okay, we'll give you a $500 million coverage, you know. And you do have a million dollar liability insurance policy for Airbnb. But it's even questioned in the, city, in the state of Virginia, that may not be covered because the state of Virginia does its own insurance. A lot of people don't. So this is just an area that you, you've helped me. Now I know that that's a whole different issue. And that's not a bad idea so, to ask So the to state can go back and maybe policy, that's one of the things you know? they want to address in 2018, like they did with the alcohol and beverage. Right. Maybe they'll put in the insurance requirement in the state law, which would change things. Thank you. Any other questions from folks who haven't had an opportunity? I mean, for me, speak? you know, for me, I'm married with children. And before Airbnb, I was having a tough time paying my bills. And because of Airbnb, it's given me the opportunity to pay my bills and 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 keep my, my, my home, you know? And, you know, the thing about changing the character of the neighborhood, I don't see how that would happen with people that, you know, are there for short-term rentals. I don't see how it's going to affect the neighborhood if you have families coming in and out of the houses, just like the family next door, okay? But... If you restrict Airbnb too much, maybe people like me won't be able to pay my bills. Maybe then I can't pay for my house, and then maybe that house is vacant for months, you know? So maybe that'll affect the character of the neighborhood if you hurt people and prevent them from paying their bills, you know? You gotta think about that also, you know? So I just hope you guys don't put any strict restrictions on Airbnb for me, because it's helping me to pay my bills and take care of my family and pay the banks that I owe money to. You talked about bed and breakfast and the cost of applying. One of the things that you folks do is you offer a service where the applicant can come in and discuss what they want to do. Pre-application meeting. Yeah, and they should be able to get a good sense of whether it's worth spending the money. They get a fair sense. Yeah, they would, they would definitely get a fair sense. Uh, so maybe we need to make people more aware of that and maybe want to still a lot of money. That's a lot of money. I mean, we're we're about 21000 into it. But if yeah, you don't know if your business is going to be successful and, and you've got twenty one in, and how many people do you have to have it's a lot. state or It clearly explains why yeah. we have none. I mean, yeah. I think that clearly well, we're, explains We're taking a, you know, we're also on a, on a periodic basis we look at our fees in general, and so we are doing that now for a whole host of different types of, of use. But the, the point here is that you were providing a great service. Absolutely, it is without question. Pre-application is a fabulous, yes. fabulous yep. service for any really anything you want to do with your property. Yeah. Ask first. Oh, I was going to ask <clears throat> if a homeowners association would prefer not to have short short-term rentals in their community. Well, there are things they can do because, you know, most of the covenants were written for four short-term mentors or even on the horizon. Are there things a homeowners association can do to protect themselves or to limit or that's change the bylaws? Yeah, the bylaws, bylaws associations have rules to protect change them. Change the bylaws. No, bylaws aren't enough. You have to change covenants. Change covenants. Yeah, yeah whatever, whatever documents your... Um, community has that established your regulations, those would need to be changed. And, if, and usually they have a process for how you change those regulations. It has to go through the process and um, uh, basically adopt new regulations and record them for the, for the development. So whatever happens with the zoning ordinance, um, communities still have that ability. Um, you know, and we don't pretend that it's easy, because it isn't easy. Some of the regulations were written so that 95% of the uh, units within that development have to actually participate in the vote. Well, try getting 95% of your community to do anything, you know, so right. you're a big community. So, you know, we, we understand there's some practical problems with that, but it's a possibility. It's out there and it's a possibility that exists. Um, 
So, you know, we may adopt regulations and somebody really could go in and say, yeah, not in our community. We're not going to have that and we're going to go through the process and we're going to change it. So that still does. So I have a question about that. Exist. So and if an HOA says you can't run a business out of your home, this is not, is or not, is not considered a business? Um, I don't know. That we've, we've looked for case law on that to see if that's been tried and tested anywhere. Yeah. We haven't found anything. We, there's been other, like we have home child care. Yeah, um, and there has the been, difference between someone having a consulting business. There I has know. been case law about yeah. having a teacher, teacher. Well, that's piano been allowed. teacher, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly Pilates right. teacher, yeah, like then you have to have the same laws for everybody, right? Right. So, so there's so, definitely, yeah, this is, which is, the, the, pro which is the problem because right. somebody who's operating an office out of their home, a consulting right. business who's just doing it on the phone, there's no impacts, you know, so, but. A business is a business, so if you right. you treat one one way and don't treat well, the other one and the other to bring, way. Also, they might have people come for meetings at their house, so therefore you also have that not allowed to do. What? They, well, well, do they do might not be allowed, but they're I'm not allowed they to do. do. Yeah. Um, so yes. you <laughs> to <laughs> people are allowed to park right. anywhere they want. People are allowed to park on public streets anywhere. Exactly. They want. Right. <laughs> I know, right. so it's, no, it's but I, I actually found out, you know, just like Airbnb, you know, the world is changing, the internet is taking over. I also found out, for example, Uber, okay? You're basically renting your car. You, you have your own car, you're taking people everywhere, right? So I know that there are neighborhoods, for example, that they say that you're not allowed to park a commercial vehicle in the neighborhood, right? So I, I know for a fact the story about the neighbors getting very, very upset because they have so many... Ubers right now, you know, in the neighborhood that basically we actually amended the zoning ordinance oh, to back in April. Okay. And we deemed that if you are using this person, if it's a, your personal vehicle and you're using it as an Uber, provided you don't have, you know, a display bigger than a certain. Yeah, anything more than that thing they gave okay. you to put on your uh, car. Oh, and you're not considered a commercial vehicle. Got okay. It. So as long as you don't have these big signs that says taxi, yeah, 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 we amended that we amended that because we amended the definition of commercial vehicle to you know, codify that, that if you have a certain vehicle that's a you know over a certain length and over a certain height, oh, yeah. then that would be a prohibited commercial vehicle. It's you know it was getting at the the vans with the you know the the, the racks on the top yeah. or you know. So, so that was amended back, but we addressed Uber in the definition of what's a commercial deal. And there'll be many more things like this. I mean, it's, you know, as they, yeah, everything is changing. Have the, uh, driverless vehicle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I know that right now people, people, there are websites right now, just like Airbnb, that actually people can rent their cars. Yeah. So, you know, you take a shuttle from the airport to a resident, to, you know, a residential neighborhood, right. pick up a car, <laughs> or do whatever right. you want, bring the car. You can rent out your car while you're working for yeah, eight hours. So exactly. You can pick up your, your car and then return it. Yeah, the just because you can't. Yeah. That means you should. Mm -hmm. Right, but then get to use it. I was going to ask, can a homeowners association make policies to, res to restrict what short-term rentals yeah. can do in, in their association? For instance, we have a swimming pool. Can we restrict and say the swimming pool is just for long-term residents? You have to put yes. it in the Bible. No, no, no. 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 If you do it as a policy, yeah. not a bylaw. Okay. You I would think you need to talk to your, you know, a, yeah, it really depends on how your rules got set up. But yeah. you, an attorney would you be able to definitely yeah. advise you best. So if you have things that are separate from covenants and bylaws. Right. Just sort of how to behave, kind of rules see, at the pool, sort of thing. thing. Or nobody can come unless they're with a, um, a, a permanent oh, resident. Right. If they're just a guest and they have their little guest pet, I mean, there may be things that you could do about that. But you would definitely have to talk. You have to talk in the context of what was approved for your development and, and find out legally what parameters are there. Because this was going back to what she had asked about insurance. You know, right, 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 right for common space in particular. Right? When you go to the planning commission on November first, you'll have a straw man. Straw we will man. have a straw man, and we will have it a week ahead of time, we and we will put it we online. We'll have straw man. What is a straw man? It's a it's a rough draft of a rough draft. Uh, straw man. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, it's so not. It won't be like a formal zoning ordinance, ordinance, ordinance amendment. It will really just be kind of here's our idea of where we think you want. 
the way that zoning ordinance amendments work is that we actually have to advertise the full range of possibilities that the board is going to consider. So we're going to try to make that as broad as possible. Certainly we don't want to make it from zero to 365 days because that's really telling you nothing. Um, so we'll have to come up with some sort of, you know, something in the middle. So, so we're trying to... It's got to be out a week before um, the mm -hmm. November 1st, so that must be what, like the 20th? Last week of October. So, yeah, so, so do you October. put it together? Who like put next it together? Week. You guys. Based on discussion. Not a week. She's framework that yes. we've already done. She will. Have to put it into. <laughs> 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 stick to the 30 days? Is that the suggestion? Or at this point? For how many days you can rent it out? No, I don't. I well, no, we'll have a much broader range than that. Yeah, I mean, we will definitely have a broader range for them to consider. And honestly, in terms of what the zoning administrator wants, it, if she, if you actually want to come down with the recommendation, I mean, sometimes we don't. We just say, here's the range. Consider whatever you want because we well, don't have a do clear have cut. A, you well, know, again, and should be this for these I think reasons. You have to give them a little. Well, that's the purpose. Really that's one of the purposes of the workshop with the, with the planning commission. The planning commission. the planning commission makes recommendations. We have two public hearings for any kind of ordinance amendment. It goes to the planning commission, who then makes with well, a public hearing, and then they make a recommendation to the board of supervisors. And then there's a separate public hearing before the board of supervisors. So the purpose of having a workshop with the planning commission is to kind of help us, you know. Once we have the straw man, are there, and to hear their questions and their comments, um, they may be taking written comments. Um, it's not a public hearing. They may, if they have time, open it up for people who are in the audience to speak. It will be televised. But that helps us further kind of uh, frame the where we might head. Yeah, maybe narrow those fields a little bit yeah. for a reasonable discussion. Yeah. So yeah, look for it the week. Before. The week before that, sometime during that week, we'll put it up on whatever that web our yeah. website yeah. specific to this use. Okay. So. John, you had your hand up. Yes, I want to ask that I'd like to talk about um, that it hasn't been discussed too much. Um, the, the the different effects that this has on HOAs versus civic associations. Um, Many the, uh, of the HOAs, the HOAs where many people in land use, uh, and this would include planning commissioners, uh, this would include um, uh, our Mason District Land Use Committee Chair and others, live in HOAs and they are protected from this. Years ago, they were sophisticated land use and they had put in covenants and protected themselves from motels in residential neighborhoods. During that same time in the working class neighborhoods, uh, they don't have lawyers. Um, they, a lot of their associations have been literally attacked by land use uh, interests to, uh, uh, to uh, disempower uh, the uh, um, associations, to break up their associations, so they're very vulnerable. Uh, Co-compliance has uh, just walked off the field. Um, that doesn't affect the HOA so much as it does the civic associations. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very clear that that is the case. Has, uh, have you discussed uh, one more thing, that rather than uh, doing the code compliance, um, the um, uh, planning and zoning has consistently um, gotten rid of regulations, loosened the regulations, like the commercial trucks and so forth, because they can't enforce it. So they just relax the uh, regulation so there's less enforcement to do. Uh, my question is, is the Planning Commission, if our, is uh, Planning and Zoning, uh, Leslie, are you done? Are you concerned about the class, uh, class uh, differences, effects on the different classes, the HOAs, the profession class, and the working class? The working class, is, as we know, their primary financial asset is their home. And we know also that putting motels in their neighborhoods, and you'll notice the HOAs don't want this. There, there's no uh, competition for motels in their neighborhoods. It seems to me there's a deliberate effort here to separate out the two classes of neighborhoods, to put these in working class neighborhoods, but not in professional uh, uh, neighborhoods. Are you concerned? I think we're going to treat, we're, we're treating it by unit type, not by class of neighborhood, whether 
you know, whether you have a civic association or whether you have an HOA, there's, you know, an HOA is a more recent phenomena, you know, dating back to some of the 80s and 90s. You know, if you have private streets or you own common property, you have an HOA. You know, some HOAs have my HOA. I have an HOA. We have public streets. And we have made, we have a lot of floodplains. So that's why we have to have an HOA. But, you know, we don't have any community facilities. And, you know, but there are HOAs who are larger, who have, you know, you know, pools and tot lots and recreation facilities. And so, you know, what we're trying to do is treat, you know, the use is the same. It's, it's not whether you have an HOA or a, a civic association, it's, you know, it's a single family detached home, it's a single family attached home, and are we going to allow certain types of uses within those single family homes? I mean, that's what it's about, and, and we would treat everyone the same. Now, if you happen to live in a, a community that has an HOA, what the state code said is that whatever rules are adopted, they don't usurp your rules and regulations for your HOA. We're not trying to take away anything by that. So if you have more, if you have more, if there are more restrictive covenants or what have you, um, then they can be enforced. I rec I understand that there are a lot of neighborhoods, the older neighborhoods, that do not have uh, HOAs. But you know that's it's not really we're not you know uh, discriminating against. Whether you have an HOA or whether you don't. So you're, you're looking at zoning this You don't discuss it. This is not an issue. You don't care. I take issue with your saying, I don't care. It's just the facts of the matter. Well, and the idea we're, that it's a hotel, at, that's what we're not establishing a, a hotel. Uh, we're not establishing the commercial use of a hotel in any of these things. Well, we're trying to, what we're trying to find that balance is to allow some type of accessory type of use of a residential dwelling for a short-term rental, and that's where you put the parameters on top of that. Leslie, so you're looking at zoning districts, right? Isn't that where you could go? We, we would be looking at not zoning districts, but whether or not you have a dwelling unit. If you have a dwelling unit, can you do this use? Like the home child care. It doesn't matter what zone. Well, it's not a good example. Okay. Home, <laughs> home, <laughs> home occupation. Looking, home we're, occupation we're, yeah, we're looking at yeah. So you're you know, saying that we're looking at the different zoning districts that allow residential dwelling. Right. And these short term rental type of uses would be considered accessory to the residential to a dwelling, dwelling regardless, of, right. regardless of where it's located or what type of dwelling. Support this in every one of those districts. You haven't made that decision yet, correct? So dwelling unit is permitted in all residential districts. But have you so, made a decision to allow this use in each in one of those districts? Well, we haven't made any decisions yet. Yeah. 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 We're looking at but, allowing it everywhere a residential dwelling unit is permitted. Yeah. That's why one of the questions was what, what type of dwelling unit should a short-term rental be permitted in? That was one of the questions to, to ensure that there is support for all types of dwelling units. But we're not looking at distinguishing between different types of zoning districts. For example, in the commercial zoning districts, those are already permitted as hotels and motels. But this would be in residential. So are districts. you asking if you have a, a single family detached dwelling in R1, could we not allow it there, but we'll allow it in a single family detached dwelling in PDH2? Yeah. Yeah, we can do that. Because, <laughs> because there would have to be a reasonable land use basis for deciding that this single family detached house is vastly different from this single family detached okay, house. So you could take all the single family detached. You right? can do it by house type, yes, okay. correct, okay. correct. Got it. I just have one more uh, comment. I'm I'm thinking that maybe the concern about Airbnb should be if people actually do things according to permits from Fairfax County and not um, uh, finishing, let's say, a basement or you know part of the house and just create an Airbnb, but just doing uh, things according to code. V 
versus short term, long term, because I think that all the valuable issues that you guys uh, raised before about insurance, using swimming pool, using you know neighborhood yard and so on, I think it's going to be more likely with people living there 30 days more versus people that come for like three, four, ten nights and basically they only come to spend the night, take a shower and go do their own things. Because the minute this is going to be their home, this is when I would see, you know, problems with using the neighborhood swimming pool or, or playing in the neighborhood, uh, whatever, basketball hoop and so on and so forth versus short-term rentals that basically you don't see them pretty much because they are there just to spend the night instead of taking, a, a, you know, a room in a hotel. Yeah, but you, you can't say that 100%. I'm not saying anything 100%. No, I'm just I, saying my opinion. No, right. I know, I know. But I mean, uh, yeah, the short term renter people are not going to behave 100% the way you know you mentioned. No, I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's, that's but we, I think most but likely most, it's the long term tenants you know, that might create more issues because they will right. host people. But it's going to be We their can home. deal with them through the way our HOA is set up. We have ways to deal with them. The problem we have is we don't have ways to deal with it's the churning of the short term. And yeah. the main thing, too, is, is when the owner is not there to take responsibility. Yeah, but the that's the benefit because they they're gone in a couple of days. They're not stuck there and you have to go to your well, HOA. Well, the benefit maybe to. You, but the, the problem is, is not everybody's the same. And, and, and I, you know, that's why, I, to me, I believe that everybody who does short-term rental should necessarily be advocated. Some, some people do it very nicely. Yeah. They take responsibility. They, they're there. Uh, it's all the cases where the people haven't been responsible that give the bad name. And until you've had to live through it as a neighbor, it's, it's like I have a right to my property. And they have a right to theirs, but it's the right responsibility that goes along with it. So well, all these have to be regulated that, in the well, right way. And they have to be there to hold the responsibility. And I think that's one of the big issues that's, that a lot of the jurisdictions, and mm -hmm. really can speak to this, you look at all of them, that when you make people stay with the people they're renting to, yeah. it makes a big difference. That's, good. Yeah, that's, that's a good idea. idea. That's a good idea. That's a good point. That's, that's, right. that's, that's, that's the facts. That's, that's a good point. These ladies that have had a 12-hour day started at yeah, morning. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Can I say something really quick? They were talking a lot. I just want to say something real quick. I, I have two. I, I live in one house and the other house I Airbnb it. And, um, and you know, for me as a host, I've been doing it for a year, over a year now. And my guests have been excellent. Never had any problems. I have no problems paying my extra taxes on the house. I have no problem registering. Well, she's not though. You know, he's, he's interrupting. Well, I, I think we've heard. I think he's saying that I cut him off and I'm allowing you to speak. So I think we've heard what you've had to say. Uh, I, I, they've been, been talking a lot. I'm almost finished. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I got no problems paying extra taxes. I have no problems paying a special insurance for my house. I have no problems registering my house. I just don't want to be limited on being able to Airbnb my house without living there. You know, because I don't live in the house. I rent it to a family, you know, Airbnb without living there. And I just don't want to be, you know, limited on that because that's how, you know, I'm making my extra income to pay off my debt. You know, and I've been doing it over a year as a host, you know, my house, renting it out short term. You know, does anybody got any questions for me? Because I'll be happy to answer any questions you guys have. Does anybody got any questions? I have a question. Sure. Why is it okay to use your house for black market activity? It's not black market it's it's activity. It's, it's for not. families that want to rent a house out. Is it illegal? You know, it's, you're paying extra income. Randy, to, is, is, it, is what he's doing right now, short-term rentals, illegal? Uh, that's, why <laughs> that's why we're here. It's that's why we're here. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. That's we're we're definitely to here to try to develop so some it's fair. I get a question to my, my previous answer. Are you concerned about the di disparate effects on the two types of neighborhoods as a matter of pub public policy, or is that not a matter of concern to you? Wait, I, I, I will say that I don't believe I agree with that. there's two disparate communities. Um, so okay. we, we will treat dwellings the same in every community, in every zoning That's district, right. in every magisterial district. 
I just feel like, you know, Airbnb people are being discriminated against, you know? Well, we're very happy you all came out. And we yeah. did look to see if there was a meetup right. scheduled for tonight, and we didn't see one. We were a little disappointed. We're afraid you weren't just, wouldn't show up. Yeah. But we're happy to have every side of the conversation as part of this and because it is not easy. Sense. And you have had your hands on yeah. I just wanted to make a comment that you can be responsible for your property and not physically be there. We right. ran out of our home, and we're not there sometimes. And we've had problems, and our neighbor said, hey, your, your tenants have put the trash in our trash cans and use them about us. So we call them. You know, they call us, we call them, they fix the problem, we tell the neighbor. You can be responsible without physically being there. Uh, contact information is something that's required to do this. You know, you should have contact information with your neighbors. Um, if, if you're doing it, whoever the owner or operator of the property, that there is solutions to some of these problems, that it's not just a matter of you know, you have to physically be there to be responsible for the activity. You should be local. You, you should be out of state. Out you that, but I understand that. And I, and once again, you're responsible, like you said. The problem becomes when you do it at a short-term rental and you're not there. And now you're putting the owner in the labor to call you when the next group comes in and does the same thing. You as a renter for long term, after third thing you can write into your contract, after the third problem, I can evict you immediately get out of here. The problem for the neighbor is, is what we went through. We were having turnover every three, four days, parties of anywhere from eight to twenty people, and so every day we were having to call another again on another problem. So we make that a rule: no parties. Excuse me. So I agree with you. There, being a responsible person like you sound like you are, if the all were that way, this probably wouldn't be as big a three sixty. The problem you've got to accept is. Most of the people are not, and they're people that own four and five. I, I, I know that's, so, yeah, that's that. I don't necessarily agree with that characterization. Most yeah. people are not. I probably believe the exact opposite. That most people probably are responsible. Well, but the, the, I'm just quoting from from hey, data I, from no, data from, I, from over 12 cities. Is the problem or the whole house people when the owner's not there? That's data. That's not me speaking. I've never had a problem over a year. Never had a problem. But that's a rule. No parties. parties. Two separate issues. Yeah. One is. Whether or not people are responsible, one is the nature of the problems when people have problems. That's right. So I agree with two you. completely different things. So that's a flawed statement. Okay. Acknowledge. I don't. So, I don't want to have parties, you know, because they're going to ruin my that's house. That's one of one of the concerns that were raised, and yeah, no parties. That we that's would be looking rule. at. But what we would encourage you is if you can attend the planning commission workshop, and you know. Please. Submit your yeah, comments ahead of time. Yeah. List of issues that you think should be included in the in the standards. Yeah, exactly. Comment on our straw man once it's available, mm -hmm. and we would look at incorporating those and addressing <coughs> each concern. Right. And again, there will be plenty of time to uh, uh, provide comments at the public hearings. Right. And this this outline that we proposed is not the final. Right. Standards. Right. So ideas that change, you have to give. We are open to taking ideas from right. both sides, and we want to make sure that we incorporate and get at a balanced, right. fair, and fair yeah. location. But yes. just because one person says yes, it should be allowed, and one person says no, it should not be allowed. That's what we want. So right. we look forward to him from you. Like the owner should be in state. state. I'm sorry. What time of the day? It starts at 7 p.m. Okay. 7 to 9 uh, on November 1st. It is a Thursday? Wednesday. Oh, Wednesday. Wednesday, November 1st. Wednesday. 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 All the information should, is on the handout. The owner of the house should definitely be, you know, local and close by. So if there is a problem, they'll be contacted. They can come to the house immediately. You know? So that's, that's a good, fair that's, rule. That's one you know, you can't be international or so out of the country. Just to, I mean, good point. But yeah. here's here's something that, that we have to consider as we develop these provisions. Mm -hmm. So let's say that's a rule. Right. And we find out you're in Spain. Right. Now that's a zoning violation. What in the world are we going to do with the fact that you're in Spain? How are we going to enforce that? How are we going to know? How are we going to enforce it? How are we How are we going to do that? So part of the part of what we develop as regulations, we have to ensure that we have mechanisms for enforcing right. that. And, and yeah. that is a they big dilemma for that. Right. 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 But it is public right. record where the people live. I'm sure you can find them somehow, some way, and, you know, you know, threaten them or whatever. You're going to take their house away. <laughs> we don't do that. that. We don't do that. Also, but at but the legally, time, <laughs> it, it has to be at the time the incident happens, mm -hmm. not at the time, like, Donna, see, until you 
about from Spain or somewhere. It, it would have to be when the incident happens, they should be owner or a representative, yeah, maybe. But we would look at everything. Yeah, and no parties, no special events. You know, that's fair. That I think we're pretty much in agreement on that. Yeah, that's fair. Thank you so much. That's understandable. Yes, Brian. I don't know if this lady is up here. She has fantastic penmanship. This is a fair award. That's a penmanship award. Sam is a relatively new plan for our office. I really, really kind of hard. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out. We Thank really appreciate you. Thank it. You. you understand the dilemma, and we understand your dilemma, and we will do our best to present something that gives the board every opportunity to consider everything everybody wants to say. Yeah, and we look forward to hearing from you. Please be fair. The match are on. When everybody, when there's never agreement on what we've done, we've been fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you've irritated everyone, you the uh, truth. That's, that's the noise ordinance. You know, we yeah. Yeah. We're trying, Peggy. We're trying. 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 We